Good afternoon and welcome to our third session of the Justice Sessions. I'm Dr. Laura Heffernan, Associate Professor in the English Department at UNF. The Justice Sessions is a year-long series of bi-weekly meetings on the topics of race and civil rights in Jacksonville, presented by multiple colleges and departments here at UNF. For those of you who have been tuning into these meetings, uh, you will no doubt have noticed that our sessions so far have felt a bit uncanny. For in speaking about the city's past, we seem also and inevitably to be speaking about our present. Our first session with Rodney Hurst on Axandal Saturday took place the day after a white vigilante in Kenosha, Wisconsin shot and killed two Black Lives Matter protesters. And Paige and Keith Cartwright, Paige Perez and Keith Cartwright's session on James Weldon Johnson two weeks ago conveyed the strange feeling that even in Jacksonville, this illustrious citizen needs to be reintroduced, redescribed, reappreciated to a forgetful city over and over again. Today, we are going to talk about the city county consolidation of Jacksonville, which happened 52 years ago and yet continues to determine our present. This is not the first time that UNF has hosted a conversation on consolidation. In 1993, Drs. Carolyn Williams and Jim Crooks of the History Department hosted a community symposium entitled Race Relations in Jacksonville Since Consolidation. The panel, which featured Reverend Charles Daly, former school board chair Wendell Holmes, State Senator Beth Betty Holzendorf, State Representative Willie Dennis, Chief Jerome Spates, and the Reverend John Allen Newman and Alton Yates. The panelists criticized school desegregation, police community relations, and the failure to fulfill the original promises of consolidation in providing adequate public services in the old city core. Jim Crooks recalls that, quote, at least two speakers felt that consolidation had done little to bring blacks and whites together over the past 25 years as seen in the largely segregated north and south sides of town. Here today to speak with us about consolidation and present conditions in the city is Ben Frazier of the Northside Coalition. We also have two student participants, Sierra Jones Frischman and Michael Kutu. Michael is a senior at UNF, majoring in English and minoring in African American, African diaspora studies and professional education. He is interning with the Northside Coalition of Jacksonville and will in a minute introduce Ben Frazier to you. Sierra Jones Frischman is a senior at UNF majoring in communication, public relations, and minoring in African American, African diaspora <laughs> studies, and urban and metro studies. They are also the public relations coordinator and contributor to UNF's 2020 Voices podcast about racial identity through the English department, and the secretary and historian for UNF's chapter of public relations, Student Society of America. They are a parent and a recently published poet as well. I should also mention that Parvez Ahmed, professor of finance in the Coggin College of Business at UNF, was originally meant to join us today but can't make it. Instead, later in the hour, we're going to screen his short presentation on nationwide and local racial disparities in wealth. Um, I also, and then finally, I'll just say that we are hoping that today will be um, more of a conversation uh, than a lecture. So I do want to encourage you to use the Q&A box throughout the session. Don't wait till the end of the hour. Um, enter your questions whenever you have them, and we will work them into the conversation as we move along here. All right, welcome, and over to you, Michael. And good afternoon. Uh, quickly want to introduce Ben Frazier, veteran journalist, news anchor, and producer, is the founder and president of the Northside Coalition of Jacksonville is dedicated to addressing the problems of social, racial, and economic injustice. The Northside Coalition is committed to neighborhood revitalization, economic development, and to solutions to the problem of gun violence in Jacksonville by making positive changes, neighborhood by neighborhood and house by house. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I certainly do appreciate this wonderful invitation to address these uh, critical and crucial uh, concerns and cares uh, here in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, of course, we are concerned that while the year has changed, it appears that uh, some other things have not. I'm actually mindful of the old uh, Souls of Black Folks, written by Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, when he described that the problem of the 20th century was the problem of the color line. Well, now, here we are at the dawn of the 21st century. And I'm here to tell you that in Jacksonville and many other particularly southern towns, that the primary and major problems that we are challenged and confronted with right now still center on the problem of the color line. Great. Can you um, talk a little bit um, to us, Ben, about, can we just start with consolidation itself? Um, because I'm not entirely sure that everybody listening knows the history of the city merger in the 60s and, and why um, it remains so relevant today? Well, what we had prior to October 1, 1968, which was the initiation of consolidation, October 1, 1968, was a smaller city in terms of the limited uh, city limits. Uh, that was back prior to 1968. But what we were subjected to was that urban slash suburban sprawl, uh, unsolicited growth, people who are moving out of the old city limits, out into the pine trees and particularly points further south. Uh, there was no planned uh, urban management. And so uh, they had to build up uh, different infrastructure and that was to the benefit of developers. Uh, that was uh, to the benefit of the people who actually moved out th there. So then there was some uh, diminishment in terms of the tax base for the city of Jacksonville. So somebody came up with a grand idea. They said, let's consolidate the city of Jacksonville with Duval County. Let's bring it all together and uh, what we'll do is we'll provide for substantial city services, uh, meaning uh, first responders, fire department, police department, uh, and we'll uh, also provide for infrastructure, uh, sidewalks, uh, street lighting, paving, or streets, and what have you. And we'll all suffer the brunt of this uh, with regard to how we make this work. So that in and of itself, it sounded like a great and marvelous democratic idea that there would be equality in terms of distribution of services for all, regardless of their specific geographic location. So uh, they had to sell that idea. There had been previous attempts to sell that idea, and they failed. So but this time around, they decided they better do something different. They needed to get some Black support. So they called on a man by the name of Earl Johnson, who was the first member of the Jacksonville Bar Association, who was black. And they said, well, now, Earl, we need you to help sell this uh, to your folks. Well, Earl really wanted to help the entire city of Jacksonville. I think we've lost Ben for the moment. So let's just wait a minute and see if he can come back online.
Okay. I'm going to give him a couple of minutes to straighten out the technical difficulties. And I think what we will do um, right now is go ahead and screen Professor, Ar um, Professor Ahmed's presentation on um, wealth inequality. Sierra, do you want to segue to that? Greetings, everyone. So as we started to consider the local issues of inequity, um, let us consider these on a larger scale. Um, <laughs> so um, Dr. Parvez Ahmed's presentation will briefly cover the racial wealth disparities in the United States. And before we get the, um, Dr. Ahmed's um, presentation started, he shared with us this excerpt from the book, The Color of Money, um, colon, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. And I'll read that to you all now. So this portion says, historian Manning Marble has lamented that, quote, the most striking fact about American economic history and politics is the brutal and systematic underdevelopment of Black people, end quote. With the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863, the Black community owned a total of 0.5% of the total wealth in the U.S. This number was, is not um, surprising. Enslaved people were forbidden to own anything, and the few free Blacks living in the North had few opportunities to accumulate wealth. What is staggering is that more than 150 years later, that number has barely budged. Blacks still own only about 1% of the wealth in the United States. Thanks, Sierra. So Ben is back, but and I think we'll just do Ben Parvez's presentation quickly now so that, um, and uh, then we'll return to the conversation about consolidation. If you look at the disparity between black and white wealth as measured by average family wealth or median family wealth, Two things stand out. A, the gulf is is pretty wide, um, and it is getting worse over time. So, which means that post desegregation, black and white families have greater disparity in their wealth than they were when we were under segregation, which is a startling, startling thing to even conceive of. Um, when we look at median family wealth, we see the same story. It actually gets worse. White families have 10 times more wealth uh, than, than black families. Uh, that same point was actually made by a study uh, that Brookings did initially. It said that at 171,000, the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family in 2016. Gaps in wealth between black and white households reveal the effects of accumulative inequality and discrimination, as well as differences in power and opportunity that can be traced back to this nation's inception. The black-white wealth gap reflects a society that has not and does not afford equality of opportunity to all citizens. And, and that's the reality of all of the things that we can measure racial disparity in, whether racial disparity in criminal justice system, racial disparity in our education, racial disparity in maternal health, of all of the things that we can measure, the one measure when all of these disparities show up in the most vivid manner is in this slide, where we see the, the wealth disparity between black and white families is 10 times worse. One of the great myths that we tell ourselves is that education is a great equalizer. Um, and we also tell ourselves that income is a great equalizer. But that story does not manifest itself when we look at black, white wealth disparity, not income disparity, but wealth disparity. So we see that for black families who are college educated, their uh, household wealth is six times lower than the household wealth of white families who are college educated. So the question often arises is how did we get here? Um, 
and obviously the answer um, starts with uh, our, our original sin, the original sin of slavery, uh, 246 years of, of slavery. But even when slavery ended, um, we did not create a system where black families could begin to accumulate wealth and reverse the damages that were suffered through uh, generations of slavery. Uh, often black families went from uh, freed slaves to from be becoming freed slaves to voluntary servitude. And, and things that were done affirmatively to improve the, uh, the economic condition of black communities, such as um, through the creation of the Freedmen Saving Bank, that did not lead to the empowerment of the black community because the systems that we often design as race neutral often end up perpetuating um, wealth disparity. So when we see this in the context even of our current time, in a city like ours in Jacksonville, where there's so much disparity between uh, people in certain parts of the town in north side and west side versus how people in the, on the, in the suburbs live, part of it is access to banking, access to grocery stores, um, access to educational institution. The, the, the access is in the unequal. Um, and once we create that unequal access uh, through often uh, what we describe as race neutral laws or race neutral system, take for example, public transportation. The public transportation in Jacksonville is ostensibly race neutral, but the impact it has because people who are living in north side of Jacksonville, it takes them two hours round trip to access the city's premier educational institution, our University of North Florida. Uh, so because of that disparity, because of that unequal access, it prevents people who are living in that part of town to access the education that they would need to empower themselves and their family. So race neutral laws are not enough to overcome uh, the systematic discrimination that has led to this grotesque wealth disparity that we see between black and white communities today. And what does this all mean? It, in, my, in my view, the focus on the last bullet point that I'm suggesting over here, it is that people who are differently situated cannot be targeted using the same policy. In other words, race neutral policies are not enough to overcome a racial wealth disparity. We have to create what we call race conscious policies, where people who are starting off from an unequal playing field have been given the opportunity to now play in a level playing field. Just telling the playing field is level and bringing in players into the playing field that are starting with significant deficit is not going to create a fair game. And that's why wealth disparity continues to get worse. In terms of specific things of, of where we go from here, things that are national in scope, but also can be applied locally. As I mentioned, access uh, to fair housing, access to affordable rental housing, uh, expansion of ownership for black families, home ownership for black families, improving access for retirement savings, improving college affordability. Um, not only we look at, it, for example, University of North Florida, uh, where uh, uh, we look at not only we have a challenge that the African-American student population at UNF does not reflect the African-American student population, African-American demographic uh, breakdown in the broader Duval County and surrounding counties. Um, and one of the reasons that African-American families do not have the ability to send their kids to UNF is college affordability. So for us to improve our demographic breakdown of, uh, uh, at, at UNF, we have to address college affordability. So things that are national in scope have local applications for us. How do we improve uh, the broken promises of consolidation? And my uh, suggestion is, of course, we have to get involved. We have to understand policy, but we also have to understand politics. We often have thought about, particularly those of us in academia, we often think about politics as something that everybody else does. 
It is not something that we need to engage in. But ultimately, policy is dictated by politics. Um, so if we don't get involved, whether we are students, faculty, or staff, whether we are members of community, if we don't get ourselves involved in the nitty gritty of um, politics, then we leave the playing field uh, for people who are unable to understand the structural issues that have led to wealth disparity and are unable to conceive race, race conscious policies that are necessary to truly, truly level the playing field. Okay, so that was uh, Professor Ahmed's presentation, which is largely about the kind of national picture um, of economic inequality um, on a national scale from basically post-segregation era to the present, which is also around the time of consolidation to the present. So moving back to our conversation with Ben, Ben, you were just about to tell us about this kind of moment of 68 where downtown, the city itself has a black population of about 44%, close to a majority. Um, and, but then there's also, you know, people moving out into the broader Duval County. Right. So then there was, in fact, a dwindling tax base. And remember, we talked about this young black man by the name of Earl Johnson, who, by the way, was a very articulate attorney. He was not just an attorney. This guy had a voice from heaven. I assure you, I remember listening to it because as a Boy Scout, he would do our honors court and Oh no, we are plagued by technical difficulties. Articulate people, period, to sell this to the people. And whoever came up with that, that idea was, was really smart. So we get this dwindling tax base because of urban sprawl and suburban sprawl and people moving out. But in addition to uh, the promises of consolidation, uh, which sounded like great democratic ideals and, and everybody getting great city services and uh, infrastructure is going to happen. We're going to pay for it and the, the tax base is going to be expanded. So they voted for it you know, by a large margin, as I said before. So since then, we come in on I-10 West and we see a sign that says, Welcome to Jacksonville. And I assure you, for 25 miles, all you see is truck stops, pine trees, and trailer homes. So, but in addition to that, what happened, of course, was the political perspective and aspect. And that was to diminish Black voting power and strength, because back then, 44% of the population inside the old city limits for black folks. It was about to be a black city. And Earl Johnson could have been the first black mayor. But his concern, as I explained to you before, was that A, he didn't want to be the mayor of Uh, there were doubts, as he expressed, before his death in 1988 uh, that maybe he could have done something different. Well, that one will go down in history as we don't know. But we do know one thing for sure, that this was a plan that was hatched to continue to uh, control by the white power structure in Jacksonville to maintain and perpetuate its political and socioeconomic control in this city and in this county called Duval. And that is what it has done. Uh, it is unfortunate that Jacksonville has a legacy of white supremacy and racism that is rooted in this 
uh, racial hatred uh, of one race against another. It is the white elephant in the room, even as we speak now in 2020, there are major racial issues in this city. And unfortunately, the white power structure does not seek to acknowledge it. We still have white city fathers who have the perspective that they are smarter than us. I guess they think they can count better than we can as well, considering they passed the city budget and didn't listen to the voice of the people who pushed for preventive and uh, intervention measures in terms of crime and, and not wanting to simply get more police and, and more technology. They ignored the voice of the people. We pushed and told them they should get more for mental health, uh, that they should do things to revitalize and redevelop economically ravaged areas, the same areas that are suffering because of the broken promises of consolidation. And as uh, Dr. Ahmed so aptly pointed out, these economic disparities can certainly be linked and traced back to policies. Now, my point is that these policies are still being perpetuated to this very moment. We are still looking at the ideals and the ideology of white supremacy in this city. The only thing that's changed is the characters and the year. Uh, we recognize that this same attitude that father knows best, that's white father knows best, by the way, is still being perpetuated today. There's no real attempt uh, to put together a program of racial progress and cooperation. What we see is people who are just as divisive as they were long ago. I'm mindful of the recalcitrance of a George Wallace, uh, of Orville Forbes, of Bull Collars, and some of the old races of the past. And I'm telling you that if we had to do it all over again, considering Governor DeSantis and his most recent attempts to stifle protest and the right to assemble, to come after protesters, that these same people, I know exactly which side of the bridge they would have been on in Selma, Alabama, when John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. and others crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. These same people would have been directing police to do the same thing that happened back then. Look what happened on May 30th and 31st of this year here in Jacksonville. Peaceful protesters, 70 people arrested, two or three buildings I think were spray painted with graffiti, maybe three windows broken, and they pulled out two armored personnel carriers, police officers dressed in SWAT gear, and beat some people and arrested them, and then a judicial system, which they tried to keep people in jail longer, give them higher bonds, and then do a settlement thereafter, having to pay those people because they violated their constitutional rights and having a settlement of $100,000. But my point is that the policy continues. I mean, I think uh, the Sheriff Mike Williams is a nice guy, but he's perpetuating the same thing that Bull Connors did many years ago. Now, I'm sorry, but I'm compelled to tell you like I think it is. Mm -hmm. White supremacy is when people think that they are better than other people because of the color of their skin, smarter than. Mm -hmm. And they are talking at us, not speaking with us, not saying, come, let's reason together. Let's use our judgment, our wisdom, our intellect. We get none of that. What we get is a city council 
that is perpetuating the same racist ideology, the same racist attitude that was perpetuated back on August 27th, 1960 with Axe Handle Saturday. Mm -hmm. It's the same attitude. It is unfortunate that the city leaders don't seem to be willing to move forward into the bright sunshine of a new day to make Jacksonville some thriving commercial metropolis, but instead are happy to turn back the hands of time to pre-civil rights times and to continue to mistreat and to marginalize and to underserve the people who live in these various communities called Jacksonville, Florida. No, they're doing the same thing and they think that we're so stupid that we don't get it. But I'm here to tell you, we get it. <laughs> the mayor is aligned himself with Donald Trump. The governor has aligned himself with Donald Trump. And clearly, Donald Trump has expressed some of the most racist ideology, white nationalist ideology, divisive things that will never bring people together. He will keep us divided. He is appealing to the worst aspect of white folks in this country. And we see that the governor and the mayor are lining up with him. We got to call it like it is. Yes. So Ben, in 2014, the city council had chaired a special task force that came up with a blueprint for prosperity too, that essentially recommended um, setting aside a certain percentage of annual capital improvement dollars to work on the infrastructure in those core urban neighborhoods that had been promised that kind of investment um, after a consolidation with the tax base growing out to all of Duval County. Um, 50 years after consolidation, two years ago, that blueprint just remains simply a blueprint. You know, the city council had not actually acted on any of the recommendations of its own um, special task force. And, you know, I know that you were in a city council meeting last night. Can you, we have a question here on the docket also asking specifically about the budget that was passed last night. I mean, to your knowledge, this blueprint for prosperity too just kind of continues to collect dust on the shelf or have they made investments of that kind? Well, there have been some minor uh, advancements and progress in so far as capital improvement projects. As a part of the budget last night, it was $100 million uh, just going to be uh, sent out to various predominantly black city council districts. But you got to understand that the money is earmarked for the old city limits. The old city limits. Now let's examine exactly what that means. Through capital improvement projects that accepted, including the I-95 Expressway, uh, Medical Park, Shands, and other areas, black folks who were living in the old city limits moved to the Northwest. So now we have a hundred million dollars to for what? The old city limits, which includes everything else that somebody is trying to build in uh, the old town, downtown area. With regards to uh, blueprints and plans, listen, we are in Jacksonville, Florida, and I speak as a native son. And I have told this directly to the mayor himself. We here in the black community are used to white men coming to talk to us white men who oftentimes speak with forked tongues. The bottom line is, we tell these folks lying to us. Uh, we don't buy what they're telling us. Consolidation amounted to a swindle, a fraud. The city bamboozled black people, 280,000 strong who call this city home. And there is no one standing up with firm and creative and courageous leadership to say what we've done is wrong and let's move now to correct it. So you're gonna tell me, you're gonna give us a hundred million dollars, a hundred million, 1950 dollars 
to do what was should have been done back then, and that makes us even. What we want is $2020 so that we're able to advance ourselves just as other geographical areas of this city are concerned. Mandarin, the beaches, San Marco. Come on, folks. Interestingly enough, uh, the, the Dr. Ahmed uh, graph was very, very interesting about the economic disparities and how education doesn't necessarily change it. Wow. I mean, so that we can still have to deal with these economic disparities, even though we're educated. Uh, they used to say in the old days, well, you know, you need people who are qualified. And the black folks got to be qualified. Yeah, well, guess what? You still have this economic disparity. We talk about crime. We didn't, they want to sell us, well, we're doing what we can because we've got to deal with crime. They literally refuse to accept and to acknowledge. When I say they, I'm talking about the white power structure, the establishment, the big ballers and the shot callers, the developers and the multi-million air folks who run this town, members of the Jacksonville Civic Council, the Chamber of Commerce. That's what I'm talking about. They refuse to acknowledge that there is a direct connection, if you will, an inextricable link between poverty, unemployment, economic degradation, and crime. So they want to give us more police officers. They want to tell us that what we need is stronger law and order, arrest more people, throw them in jail and throw away the key, and not recognize or acknowledge the root causes of the crime. In some 10 block census areas of various economically ravaged zip codes, like 32209, where there are 34,000 people, most of whom are black. There might be 600 white folks in the whole zip code. 32206, 17,000 people. And 32208, which is the Great Northwest Quadrant. Some 10 block census areas, 50% of the people are living below federal poverty guidelines. That is absurd. That is appalling that we would allow people to live without septic tanks, as if they're living in some third world country, people having to do their business in pots because they don't want to walk in the backyard and step in it. That is absurd. Why don't we see the kind of creative and courageous municipal leadership that we need? All we see is simply the perpetuation and the maintenance of the way it's been done all these other years. I don't see the progress. I don't see the leadership. And that is where I think the major problem is. We don't have the bold creative leadership that we need to move our city forward. Um, Mr. Frazier, so a lot of the promises from um, consolidation were meant to fix roads, um, improve water, sewer, drainage system, implement um, street lights, um, and that sort of thing. And a lot of talk over the years has been about redrawing the districts. Do you think that that is something that will improve the situation? And if not, um, do you have any other suggestions about what residents of Jacksonville can do to implement some of the, the initiatives that we, people have been waiting 52 years for? Well, I don't think simply redrawing districts is gonna be the answer. Uh, what we get is uh, numbers, crunchers, and uh, city hall pencil whipping us with regards to budgets. What we need is truth and honesty in government. What we need is revitalization and redevelopment in these economically ravaged communities. We're not seeing it. That's what we need. 
We need to help these specific geographic areas, 322 08 We need to help the elderly, the young people who are there. There needs to be a renaissance, if you will, in revitalization and redevelopment in every aspect from art to music to business to health we've got to do something different we cannot continue to do the same thing and expect different results with regard to the arts jacksonville could be another harlem renaissance if we focused and utilized the skills and talents and gifts of our young people in the areas of the arts, we could do the same thing in business. Why isn't the city moving to assist young black entrepreneurs to open businesses in these areas? Why don't they have the support and the partnership of the Jacksonville Civic Council and the Chamber of Commerce to help them. We're talking about the free enterprise system. We're not talking about socialism. We're saying support them. What about the support of minority businesses? Why isn't the city doing more? Why aren't we letting more contracts to black businesses? Why are we giving millions of city dollars to the sons and daughters of the people who got the money one generation ago before them. We're seeing the same thing, this passing down of wealth that Dr. Ahmed talked about from one generation to the next. And the same people who are getting the short end of the stick. We want our piece of the financial pie. I mean, that's what this is supposed to be about. Work hard, get a good job, get credit, buy a house, raise a family. Why, why can't we be fair by people? Why don't we open up and say, yeah, well, redlining was wrong and we need to do something to correct it. We're not helping people or being honest with people. We're getting uh, a little bit older now and uh, we are seeing things kind of like just the way they are. It's unfortunate, but I see the same racism. I see the same racial disparities and I don't see a willingness on the part of the city to actually initiate progress. We have a couple of questions in the docket that are specifically about what people can do now. Um, so we have a question from Daniel Connors. Would a fix for the apathy of our local officials um, simply be voting them out or are there actions we can take now to sway political opinion while they are in office? Um, and he asks a follow-up question about given the fact that protest um, has so far been met by um, heavy policing. What other things can people do um, to kind of influence the actions of local politicians? We have a second question kind of along those same lines as well. Well, allow me to say that in terms of activism, there are three things we must always do. Agitate, educate, organize. Our agitation must continue because power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. If there is no struggle, there can be no progress. We must continue the struggle. In the words of my friend Rodney Hurst and Rudy Jamison's latest book, The Struggle Continues, we must continue to agitate and never let them think, in the words of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, never let them think one moment that we're satisfied with things the way they are. I'm here today to let the mayor, the city council, and all the 
powers that be in this city know we are mad as hell and we're not going to sit down and take it. If it means we need to initiate economic boycotts, we will. If it means we need to block highways and bridges, we will. We will continue to agitate until you hear, listen to the voice of we the people. Now, with reference to uh, the politicians in office, should we continue to attempt to talk with them? Yeah, as long as they're in power, we're going to talk to them. But the fact of the matter is, if they're not doing what we need them to do, we need to figure out how to get them out. And as long as it is legal and not illegal, as long as it is moral and not immoral, I'm all for it by any means necessary. They need to get out. They are not looking out for the people that they promised to serve and to protect. They are continuing to ignore our needs, destroy our families, and it's simply not right. I believe that for the greater good, we need to get rid of some folks that who are already in office, long story made short, they need to go. In the meantime, um, while we are uh, waiting for the opportunity to vote them out, how can we find out if we live in a district covered by those funds and what we can do to advocate for the implement implementation with the current city council members? Well, the, the problem with the post-COVID era is that you can't really go down to City Hall like you used to. Uh, you can't go sit down and meet with the city council person. Uh, you can't really even go to a city council meeting. So we're trying to devise different methodologies in terms of uh, advocacy. Uh, we can send a lot more emails, folks. They had to read those emails. You noticed that last night. Now they have to read those emails in the meeting. So sit there on your computer and whatever you think is right, bang out a letter or two or three, send them to all 19 members of the Jacksonville City Council, and then think of another subject that you think. You got to be involved. We cannot sit back because they will actually attempt to utilize your apathy or your uh, in fact that you've not been involved against you. Matt Carlucci, who's the Finance Committee Chairman, said, well, I allocated three hours uh, uh, for the people to speak, and uh, there was just nobody there speaking. Listen, people are trying to understand Zoom, okay? Get, get real. He may have been very serious and very honest in his effort to reach out or to provide for uh, public comment but he failed. People are still trying to understand how to get Zoom and we know who has computers and who does not have computers. We know that too. So the city's gonna have to do a better job, but yeah, we, we've got to stay involved. And I'm telling you that you and your computer and, and email and the fact that you know how to write a good paragraph goes a long way. Please be involved. Utilize your God-given skills, gifts, and talents to be involved in the political process. Yes, vote, but also be fully engaged. And to be fully engaged, you've got to talk to the people who make policy. You've got to. You've got to communicate with them. One of my favorite sayings is effective communication is absolutely essential. Sierra? We have another question um, from our audience that is talking about the Emerald Trail, and I know that's been a lot um, been going on with Groundwork Jacks. And they're wondering about the Emerald Trail and other initiatives like these that are intended to revitalize historically underrepresented parts of town like La Villa. And um, Justin Sipes is wondering if about other initiatives like this, and do you believe that these sort of projects are what the city needs? Most definitely. Anything rooted in the history of this city 
needs to be uh, placed on a pedestal. You're talking about the Emerald Trail, the East Side, and we need to think about doing something special in the La Villa era, uh, area. Uh, we, we're talking about historic areas of the city and we are ignoring them. Uh, to the Northwest Quadrant, uh, there used to be a place called the Two Spot where all the greatest entertainers came right here to Jacksonville, Florida. Bet you never heard of the Two Spot. It's right there at 45th and uh, Moncrief. Jacksonville is a big music town. That's part of our legacy, part of our branding. Jacksonville just has to begin to recognize who we are. Uh, Jacksonville has never really resolved its own personality. We kind of like waffled in between a southern town you know, on the ocean, and we didn't really make up our minds, you know, what kind of personality? You, we, you know about New Orleans, right? The Big Easy. Uh, but we know about New York City. We know about Chicago, that Tottenham town. We know about LA. We got to have our own personality and we need to build it on our true legacy. Jacksonville is a city of sports heroes. Going all the way back to when Hank Aaron played here in the old Negro baseball leagues to many of the people who work in the NFL over the past 20, 30 years. We need to define who we are. And I'm here to suggest to you that Emerald Trail, uh, the Northwest Quadrant, sports heroes, music, this is a part of our branding. We need to decide to be more than just the rest stop of I-95 where people We lost that last bit, Ben, can you? We've got you back now, but we lost you at rest stop off I-95. Yeah, yeah. My point is that we need, Jacksonville needs to be more than just a rest stop on I-95 where people stop and get a cold drink and uh, some peanuts or some crackers and then get back on the freeway again and go farther south to Tampa, Orlando, or Miami. We need to define who we are. And I'm telling you, we, we can do some branding and that branding is multicultural, that branding is multiracial, and that, that, that branding crosses all the barriers that we need to begin to cross. It is heinous that we are still hating on people because of the color of their skin. We need to bring this diversity to a good place. We need to begin to shake hands and cooperate for progress in this city, socially, economically, and culturally. We need to define who we are. And it's a positive place that we can go, but it will take bold and courageous leadership to give us that vision and to give us the chutzpah to know how to get there. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour and um, I think that's a, about all we have time with. We've answered most of these questions. Um, unless anybody, I'll just leave space for one minute. And if anybody's entering a question right now, we'll take one last one. Otherwise, I think, let's see. Yes, I think we're good. Um, thank you so much, Ben Frazier, for coming and speaking to us thank about you. this. And um, especially after city council, again, last night, um, passed an unchanged budget. We appreciate your optimism this morning and uh, your willingness to speak with us on this topic, which as you said, is gonna be a long fight. So um, 
And thanks everybody else for joining us for our third justice session today. I hope you have a good Wednesday and we'll see you in two weeks time um, for our fourth session.